All right. I think it's about time to begin. Welcome to the uh, closing plenary session for our uh, spring 2023 member meeting. I hope that you have had a um, good day and a half here and uh, have had an opportunity to catch up with old colleagues, meet new colleagues, uh, learn some interesting things, trade ideas. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn it over for our final session, but before doing that, I just want to take a couple of minutes to thank some folks. Um, we've had just an extraordinary set of plenary and breakout um, sessions at this meeting. Uh, at least that's sure how it felt to me from the ones I had an opportunity to engage in. And um, I'd like to uh, ask you to join me in thanking all of our presenters, including, I just want to note, the conveners for the um, breakfast topical uh, roundtable discussions, an innovation that we tried out for the first time at this meeting, and based on the um, comments I've been hearing, uh, I think you can expect to see again at our December meeting. So please join me in thanking all of our presenters and conveners. I want to also just say a big thank you to the CNI staff and the AV team. Um, they make it look easy. It's not. Um, it just looks like it happens by magic. And I am always enormously grateful uh, to them for how smoothly they make all of this work. Please join me in thanking them. And now let me get on to the main reason we're here this afternoon. And um, the closing session is gonna be a panel on the American Council of Learning Society, of, of Learned Societies Commission on Fostering and Sustaining Diverse Digital Scholarship. That's quite a mouthful. Um, I just wanna draw a couple of lines. Uh, from um, one place to another. This, this commission actually is very much um, along a line of inquiry that goes back to the early days of CNI, um, our concern with how scholarship is sustained, how it is preserved, how it is brought forward, how it, um, survives uh, transitions in technology and scholarly practice. This is something that our community has been concerned with for literally decades. We've also been really concerned with the kind of infrastructure in the broadest sense of social as well as technical infrastructure to um, make these things happen. You'll recall back um, not long after the turn of the century, the Atkins Report, um, the Commission uh, on um, Cyber Infrastructure in Science and Engineering, chaired by Paul Evan Peters Award winner um, Dan Atkins. Uh, that gave rise to a um, complementary report a few years later called Our Cultural Commonwealth, which was um, prepared by uh, a commission, um, again, assembled under the auspices of the American Council of Learned Societies and um, chaired by John Unsworth, who uh, has been a member of our community for a very long time. Today, we are going to hear about the thinking, the conversations, the um, the uh, forming recommendations of a commission that has been working, I guess, for about 
two or two and a half years now uh, that was established by um, the ACLS, funded by the Mellon Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities, and really looking at how we foster and sustain diverse digital scholarship um, as we look at this sort of um, you know, explosion of diverse inquiry based um, on digital tools and uh, digital data and using um, uh, the digital media to communicate their insights. There are many people involved in this commission and um, we have links uh, on the web page and in the program to the commission. Uh, we unfortunately couldn't figure out how to have a conversation among 15 or so commissioners. Uh, so um, we picked out um, a few. Uh, we picked out voices that were perhaps less familiar um, to the CNI community than a few of the um, other commissioners uh, who regularly uh, join us at CNI. And also we were looking for a um, set of voices that really um, can bridge the scholarship, the scholarship issues as well as the infrastructure issues and that allow the needs of the scholarship um, to kind of drive uh, the thinking about sustainability and um, infrastructure. Uh, some of you may have seen um, uh, Marissa Parnham's um, presentation when the commission was launched uh, that that took place when we were all virtual during the early pandemic uh, but the commission's at least as far as I can tell been kind of quiet since then so I think this I hope this will be a unique opportunity to um, begin to gain insight into where their deliberations have taken them. With that, I am going to turn it over to James Shulman, who is the Chief Operating Officer and Vice President at the American Council of Learned Societies. He will moderate the panel and introduce the panelists. And before handing over to him, I just want to take a moment to express my thanks uh, to him. He has been just a wonderful, wonderful partner in uh, putting this session together with me. And um, uh, I can't thank him enough. James, over to you. Great, thank you Clifford, and thanks all of you who uh, are here with us today. Uh, we're gonna hopefully keep this lively. We have uh, some of the more fun and brilliant people that you will meet uh, here with me, and so we're gonna have a conversation. Um, the, the report is not done, so if anyone thinks they've missed it, you have not. Uh, there's, uh, there's much left to do. It's a huge and fascinating set of socio-technical uh, questions and problems. We've been holding focus groups for the last uh, month or two. Uh, I think 22 of them, four with librarians and archivists, three with publishers and platforms, one with history department chairs, one with English department chairs, one with clear fellows, uh, more, lots more. Uh, and part of that really is based both to test the thinking of that the commission has been uh, going through and, and how to uh, sort of bring together and synthesize all the, all the issues and possibilities involved. And also, but part of it has been to build out the networks uh, that will uh, continue to support this work, both near term and long term. And guess what? You all are now a big focus group. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna have some plenty of time for questions and, uh, and we can handle anything. I'm not sure we can answer it, but we can handle anything. So, um, uh, 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 as Clifford said, I mean, when he talked about the, the sort of social part of the uh, social technical uh, work involved, and involved in all of your lives, one of the things that is going to come out of this report is not just a report, but um, uh, some work on the networks that are, are in place, the networks that are not in place, the networks that need to be bolstered, and I think most importantly, the networks that need to collide. 
Um, ben Vincent, who's a provost at Case Western and on the commission, uh, when uh, I, we were having a discussion with him at one point, said, I, I talk to provosts all the time. He said, but you, you know, when you talk about ACLS and committees of department chairs, I don't ever talk to department chairs, and I certainly, I mean, I talk to department chairs, but I don't talk to a committee of department chairs. When Charles Watkinson, uh, who's on the commission and who's uh, serving this year as uh, president of the uh, uh, Association of University Presses, uh, we're, we were talking about some of these issues. We brought Charles to talk with a set of university deans of humanities that we meet with regularly at ACLS. Well, they were thrilled because they were going to try to figure out book issues and publishing issues on their own, but they're, they're university deans. They do a lot of other things. So it's those collisions of networks that will be, that won't be just part of the report. That will be part of the, the product of what, what this commission's doing. Um, a few quick thank yous. One is to, uh, to Patricia Sway and Don Waters, who started this work uh, a couple of years ago when Don was still uh, at Mellon, worrying about the well-being and sustainability of projects that they'd um, funded, resources they'd uh, helped support, um, and then Brett Bobley at NEH the same way. Uh, Carol Mandel, many of you know well, is really leading a research team that's supporting the work of this commission, and she's, she's failing retirement entirely because she's working really hard on this, which is great. Uh, three other uh, people working on that team are Katrina Fenlon uh, at the iSchool at the University of Maryland, uh, Zoe LeBlanc at the iSchool at University of Illinois, and my colleague uh, Kiana Nurse at ACLS. So that's the team working on this. Um, the timing is that uh, the, the work will uh, appear this year. These are busy folks, so we have to let them go. They can't work forever, but they're, uh, so we're gonna, um, but uh, exact timing of that uh, is not, not done, and there's gonna be some vetting of it with lots, lots of you, and we hope that we can call upon you. So let me start by asking, um, and just in the er order that we're sitting with Meredith and Maria and Mary Emma, just to give um, a sense of a project that they've worked on that brings them to this commission and, uh, and to this audience. So I'll, I'll start, with, start with you, Meredith. <laughs> oh, good afternoon, I'm Meredith Evans. I am the director of the Carter Presidential Library, but today I just get to be Meredith, so I don't represent the government, so please don't think I do. Um, I'm also an archivist by trade, that's my heart, that's my love, and serving on this commission has been fantastic because it's really reinvigorated a few of my passion projects that I still pay attention to and help with as much as I can. Um, when I was at WashU way back in 2014, somewhere around there, um, Ferguson had just happened, Michael Brown was killed, and we started an open access archive um, documenting the protests and we created an Omeka instance on the fly, and we asked people to just upload photos or whatever they wanted while they were out protesting. We didn't take names, we didn't take information. We were starting to build a community archive digitally. Um, we only requested an email address, so in case we saw something that we thought shouldn't, wasn't appropriate, then we would email you and let you know, and you would either take it down or we would remove it. Um, that project escalated into a lot of different things, um, it still exists today. Uh, if you are from the library world or archival world, the metadata is not wonderful, but it is searchable. Uh, but it was also used by the police, unbeknownst to us, um, throughout the years um, to identify people who were protesting to um, serve them and, and do all types of other things that law enforcement do. So while at Wash U, Burgess Jules, um, a good colleague, he's now working for Shift Design, and I were talking and discussing what were next steps. And we approached Don Waters, <laughs> uh, his name might come up quite a bit, while he was at Mellon, to think about um, building tools to um, use for using Twitter as an actual research data, in a, research data from Twitter in an ethical way. Uh, and one that protected the activists that were utilizing it to um, organize and to meet and to provide instructions. And DocNow still exists today, and there are four tools that work that um, DocNow produced that basically allows you to use AI and um, look through Twitter feeds and collect that data in mass, mass ways, but also reminds you about the ethical things to do with that. There's a community that you're taking from to publish work. Um, and, and so it, we, we want people to understand when you look at that product, 
and all the, all the tools that exist, that there's an ethics that you need to uphold with that. You know, you're, you're not just using the, tw the tweet for your research, you're actually taking something that somebody said in an, an instance, may or may not believe 10 years from now, and we wanna make sure that we are helping people see from an archival perspective that yes, this is valuable data that we wanna keep um, forever and be able to reflect on later, but we also wanna make sure that we are um, doing right by the people who've tweeted or used any kind of social media at that time, whether it's to organize or express themselves, um, whatever they may look like. So part of Doc Now also came out of that was organizing activists and helping them build community archives on their own um, from a digital perspective. And so that continues uh, as well. So I, 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 I am a formal archivist, so to speak, but I think it's important for people to save and speak for themselves. And those are, these are repositories that can be used for educational purposes at any point um, in conversation with that community archivist or with that activist or with the group that's collecting. So that's a brief summary of what I'm working on. Great, and we'll turn to Maria and I, I will give you the out that Maria said, can I use my slides? And I said, no slides. So we're, we're just doing discussion, but Maria, you're gonna, if you start waving your hands, we know that you're pointing to slides in your head. Uh, I'm very slide dependent because I'm a, an associate professor and this is the air we breathe, the water we swim in. Um, so my name is Maria Cotera. I'm an associate professor in Mexican American and Latino studies at the University of Texas. I was at the University of Michigan until around 2020. I moved in the COVID times to a, uh, a place that is um, not the easiest place to do ethnic studies or women's studies in. So um, uh, I'm here to, I'll say a few words about a project that I've been working on in collaboration with Dr. Linda Garcia Merchant since 2009. Um, and I should say, I want to begin by saying that giving you a, a sort of deeper history, my mother was a radical librarian and archivist in the 1970s um, and very invested in the power of information, um, the transformational power of information. So I think that is where I come by um, our approach to this project. So in a nutshell, Chicana por mi raza is a digital archive. Uh, it, it currently contains around 20,000 uh, digital assets, including oral histories. As I said, it was started in 2009. Um, in infrastructurally, where does it live? So it lives on a server, a machine at uh, the Texas Advanced Computing Cluster. Um, it, as I said, it's 20,000 digital assets, so it's about three or four terabytes of space. Um, and we also have, and that is a login protected, uh, it's on a login protected data management system. Uh, we use a system called Clouder, which was developed for the sciences and data sharing in the sciences. Um, we also have a public website, uh, Chicana por mi raza, um, and that is, includes timelines, biographies, short historical essays, all of which are written by students, mostly undergraduates, who work on the project. Although they are also vetted, especially the bios, by the women whose oral histories we co collect. So that's an important um, part, and it, it also touches on some of the ethics um, that were just mentioned, right? And we can talk about that in a bit. I do want to give a little backstory to the project because it's important to understand um, why the project functions in the way it does. Uh, we started the project in 2009, um, and when we started the project, Linda Garcia Merchant was actually in the private sector. She was a filmmaker in Chicago. She had made a documentary about her mother and my mother and a network of women, uh, Chicanas, Latinas, who were involved in the National Women's Political Caucus. She and I came together because we saw this history nowhere. We saw Chicanas and Latinas, well, we didn't see them. What we saw was an absence, right? And I understood pretty early on, because my mother was an archivist at the Benson Latin American Collection for about two decades, you know, that this was because of an archival feedback loop, right? Which is to say that archives weren't being collected from these women, um, therefore historians were not writing, or scholars weren't writing histories or monographs that included them, therefore archivists, uh, you know, they didn't see what they didn't see, right? You don't know what you don't know. And so they weren't being, there's this continuous feedback loop. 
you know, this absent presence is what I call it. And so Linda and I, um, both of whom had mothers who were very active in social movements in the 1970s, decided that what we had to do was intervene and create our own archive. In that way, it's not actually that different from what Meredith has described, right? In that it's focused on activism, it's focused on um, individuals who have very uh, complex relationships with institutions like libraries, universities, and the police and the state. And so, you know, we had to sort of imagine and conceive of our archive in a different way than, you know, might be typical for uh, an archive in an institution. It is a post-custodial archive, and basically our methodology is usually we travel to women, to their homes, uh, we conduct oral histories, usually with two or three students in tow. Sometimes my mother comes along for fun, um, and because she knows many of them. And um, we scan archives. We scan anywhere from, in a single visit, we might scan t you know, anywhere from 20 to 2,000. We scan 2,000 photographs of, um, by photographer Nancy de los Santos when we visited LA. Um, and so, you know, this is very bootstrapped. Uh, from all the way from like, you know, the, the imperative to the, our, you know, ethical uh, modalities of approaching women um, and managing the assets that we collect from them, ensuring them uh, access to those assets, ensuring that they maintain access to them, ensuring that they maintain copyright, that's incredibly important, right? So we have the rights to use these materials for educational purposes, but we also have to be very careful um, about making sure that they, um, they have the right to both access them and determine what happens to them. If someone's gonna publish them, we uh, photograph, for example, we'll connect them to uh, the donor. Um, the other important part of our project is that uh, it is an, uh, an archive that is not extractive, right? It is not a resource in the typical sense that we might imagine archives. It is, in fact, uh, we imagine it as a collective. So all of the people that are working on the archive, the donors, the students, the partnerships that we create in other places that are doing projects that have the same scope, um, those people, those individuals are members of the collective, they have access to the archive, but the general public does not. So that raises a whole question about open access, which is almost always seen as an uh, indisputable good or a universal good, but it's not always the case that it is. And for different communities, that might mean different things, right? They might not be willing to have open access. Um, I think, you know, those are some of the issues that I think are important to our practice. I also want to say that I appreciate Meredith's mentioning of the ethical um, imperatives that are at the center of their praxis, their digital praxis, because, you know, we have a, actually a list of 10 you know, sort of um, protocols for how we conduct our work that are very different from the typical, from, from what might be the protocols of the IRB or other kinds of protocols, right? So they're very distinct to our work and happy to talk more about that um, later. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, I'm joining my colleagues here with great excitement. I've tried to meet as many of you as possible uh, on this, my first visit to CNI, but I just want to thank you for welcoming us and allowing this forum so that, um, which I think is essential to continuing before we finish the report. I think that the dialogue's gonna be really important. Um, so I'm Miriam Graham. Um, I am the founding director of the History of Black Writing. Um, that name, of course, has evolved, and I will give you, I don't usually do this, I'll tell you what the very first name was, but it was such a horrible, clunky title, I was advised to change it. It was the Com Computer Assisted Analysis of Black Literature. <laughs> but when we had an acronym, it was CABLE. So, but those who were joining with me felt it was just not going to work, but this is 1983. Wow. So we turned 40 this year. It was, and I had gone to school in the theory era. I had gone to graduate school, and I kept saying to myself, what are we gonna do with all this theory? We don't know the text that the theory is based on. We were doing recovery work, which is how I entered you know, content, um, collect, collecting content and building collections. Um, but it was clear to me that we didn't have the basis for some of the theories that I was being forced to consider. And I felt that if I were going to at least participate in that conversation, I needed to have my facts straight, I needed to have data. 
So the idea in the 80s, the idea of having more data meant that you had to do collection development. You had to recover work. And this was a big, as you know, a big era for recovery. Um, and so graduate school for me was really trying to hone in on some skills, uh, including the skills of a librarian, which is where my GRA ships were often based, um, so that we could really have the basis for doing ongoing work. So the history of black writing started in 83. It is now today, as I say, it is now 40 years old. Now, I'm sitting here, my gray hair shows every year of that era and that period, but from the very beginning, it was clear to me too that we would have to rely on students to do the work. We would have to collaborate with other people because there was no infrastructure, so to speak, of. Nobody had considered having an entire project devoted to just recovering a body of literature and then trying to preserve it and make it accessible to others. And that was a very fairly simple mission at the time. Recover, preserve. But we were in the era of increased use of technology for any kind of humanities-based research. So I was around people who were doing that kind of work, and I simply asked, what if? So I'm talking to computer scientists, and I still do, and I know less now than I, do then, I did then, and I still use the same approach. I say, this is what I need, this is what I want, can you do it? Can you do it? And in the morning, we have something that we can work on. So that back-end work was always based on working with somebody else. So the collaboration was there from the very beginning. Once we found about a thousand titles and we did enter them into a computer bibliography, a computerized bibliography, today we call it a database, and we started with about 1,500 titles that we were recovering, we found. Most of these, I must say, were titles that were not known, were not being taught, or actively discussed, almost no criticism or critical reception had been applied to them. Today, what we call the HBW corpus is seven, more than 7,000 titles. Most of those are titles that we have recovered that is, again, little known, understudied, uh, underread. So that collection development ultimately became essential for preservation and the way to do it, of course, as you well know, was digital methods. So we began that project early, but funding was unavailable. It was simply not feasible. The project wasn't sophisticated enough. The long list of reasons why that funding didn't come early. But when it started coming, it, it worked very well. But we were also very clearly aware early that if you have all this new knowledge, we are creating new content, Who's going to create the work based on the content? Who's teaching these works? So a professional development component became very important for our work. We also discovered that that was how we could get more funding. <laughs> and NEH has been a partner for us for a very long time through their Division of Education. But the other side of that was those people who participated in some 15 of our institutes became our expanded network at the History of Black Writing. So we had a built-in system of training, teaching, instructional models that were being developed through those institutes, and with early career professionals in particular, projects that were emerging based on all this new content from the corpus. Now, we were primarily started working with fiction, the novel at first, then fiction generally. We are now working on memoirs. So those sides of the work were always there. Public facing was the third piece. St again, student-centered, research-intensive, but public facing. We felt that accountability was essential to what we were doing. 
how does the public respond to all this new stuff? Is it just for scholars only? So those three pillars, so to speak, the student-centered nature of the work, relying on the staff, uh, because we didn't have support to pay people to do, the, to do that kind of work, but then, then making sure that we would continue to build the, the database itself, but also having, some, having users, the language of today, the user experience, who, who, who are our publics? Who are our various publics? And we started with things that were fairly simple. I was at the University of Mississippi at the time. We decided to bring Richard Wright back to Mississippi, which was a pretty bold thing to do in 1985. And we did. International scholars, an international conference who had been studying Richard Wright, we brought him home to Mississippi. And that was the kind of sort of public facing model because it was not an academic exclusive conference. It was a conference open to teachers who wanted to bring their classes. Community people who knew Wright was from Mississippi, but they never knew much about him because his books were banned in Mississippi. So we are obviously violating laws at the same, at the same time. So the public facing component was something we were fairly good, got very good at the beginning. Now by 2010, after a series of professional development institutes, work again expanding in terms of the collection development, we recognized that the digital era was passing us by. So we launched whole hog into a new project, which is the one that I think brought me to the commission, and it's the Black Book Interactive Project. Note that it does not have digital in the title. And that was because early on, we were encountering people who did not see this as something akin to their interests or useful in any way, there was resistance. And we felt that the broadest base we could create would be to explain to people that literature interacts with lots of different things. Technology is one of those things. So the Black Book Interactive Project was a bit broader at the time in order to help expand that community. So BPIP is the digital component of the history of black writing. And it does include the HBW corpus that continues to expand. It has a metadata schema. And because we did not have uh, the way to access this collection, we partnered with the University of Chicago at first uh, before we were able to be in a position as we are now to work with computer science and engineering to build the platforms that we need. So for a long time, we were operating with Philologic, the interface that is still at the University of Chicago, and about half of our titles are available through that way. But BPIP quickly acknowledges that building a network, a knowledge network, is absolutely essential. So that professional development side of it continued to expand. And I want to get my numbers straight here, or the staff that we now have is about 25 people will be very upset with me. But it looks like we are now in our fifth and sixth cohorts for the Black Book Interactive Project Scholars Program. We created, with the help of Afro-PWW, the Illinois Eye Open Program, those partners, Hadi Trust, a lot of the training. We have three cohorts that have already, since 2010, 12, who have been through an introductory program in the digital humanities. We asked the Office of Digital Humanities to consider a more advanced program, which they did. And we are now in our second digital publishing program. So many people who come through the introduction program have a project they want to get through published, then they go into that advanced program. So we now have six cohorts that are mainly being exposed and introduced to digital methods, but bringing projects with them or being exposed generally. So the resistance is not as much as it was in the beginning, but we still feel that 
the idea of having a broad-based network, public librarians, community activists, small collections that are yet made their ways into any, any libraries because of the extraction issue that we've already talked about here. So, but we want people to have those skills. So that Black Book Scholars, uh, Black Book Interactive Project Scholars Program is open to anyone who wants to gain the skills and develop. But what it also has are advisors. People can help you do the work and provide that work. And that funding, of course, is all external. So in terms of our infrastructure, we rely primarily on collaborative methods until we are able to provide that kind of support. We do not get the kind of university support, needless to say. But it is the project that I have been identified with and that has been the fastest growing in our HBW family. Great. So, you know, for anyone out there who thinks that digital humanities work is like full of gee whiz, three-dimensional fly-throughs, everything like this, th these are these are three extraordinary collection building efforts, right? And all the issues that you all know about collection building and data ethics, and but uh, all you know, built with the, the, the steam and energy of entrepreneurs. Um, let me, I'm gonna do something a little risky. I'm gonna, we have about 35 minutes left and I wanna, we're gonna cover three topics in, in conversation but also in conversation with you. So I'm gonna give you a heads up to what the roadmap is. And if you have a question in that section, we're gonna ask you to bring it up during that section because otherwise you've all been working hard, your brains are full and you shouldn't just sit back and relax. So you should like, so none of the, you know, sort of, I'm gonna wait until the third question is asked to bring up my question. If there's something in this that you wanna ask, you're gonna to have to come up and ask it, okay? So the three sections are, we're gonna talk about field building. So these are collection buildings and they're also about field building. Two, we're gonna talk about entrepreneurial risk of scholars and librarians doing this kind of work. And then three, we're gonna talk about institutional support and infrastructure support, and where, where, where you found it, where the commission talks about it, and where we haven't found it, where we found gaps. So those are the three topics, so get your questions ready. So I wanna start by, um, by talking about field building, uh, because um, I think if there's one thing that university presidents and provosts all agree on, within an institution and across institutions, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of belief, and I, I think it's heartfelt, in, uh, in working to diversify the faculty, right? Uh, we disagree about a lot of things. We disagree about programs and budgets and uh, all kinds of things. Um, we can think of lively things. But, but one thing that I think universities, or colleges and universities, all are pretty in line with is saying we want to diversify our faculty. A lot of times that happens with sort of a, a focus like this. We want to attract and retain diverse faculty. And yet this work that we've been talking about and the work that the commission is focused on is about all the work that happens outside of that narrow frame. Like if you want to attract and retain faculty, and maybe they're not interested in working on Wordsworth, right? Because Wordsworth is wonderful, but a lot of people are working on Wordsworth and a lot of archives, but sometimes people want to build, work on other things. And to do that, they might have to build the resource as we've been talking about, as you've been talking about, in order to do that work. And so, so I wanna, um, I wanna, if you have thoughts about field building, but I wanted to ask the panelists to think about what it means to build fields and to build the collections that build fields and build careers. That's such a great question. Um, it's actually one of the reasons I left academia. Um, <laughs> I, you know, that's a, that's a real statement because I diversified collections everywhere I worked in the academy. And it took a lot of convincing of the donor. It took a lot of convincing of my employer. Yet I knew the collections were valuable and people would want to know more instead of um, speculating. Um, at the same time, Doc Now came along um, because we were going through a lot of protests and, res and poor responses to police brutality. And there were a lot of people that wanted to document that experience, but the you know, academia wasn't one of them initially. It was more of how can we get information from these people and print, you know, publish our articles with that information. It wasn't about caring for the people who wanted to be remembered or wanted this event to be remembered um, differently from what you saw on television. And so 
I think that the tools that DocNow is building, not only is it tools that anybody can use in open source, but it also started building communities, community activists wanting to do become archivists, archivists wanting to help community activists without putting it behind the ivory towers necessarily, or at least convincing the ivory tower how to partner with these institutions without dominating, which is key. Um, it was very it's very difficult to accept a collection and not a as an institution and not keep the rights to it. Right. That is not something that people feel comfortable with because all our legal staff is going to say, oh no, if something happens, then it's our problem. Mm -hmm. that, but that's the way to build community, mm -hmm. right? The building community part is relinquishing all complete control, um, which is a challenge in our professions. I'm, I hesitate to say this because it's going to sound like, uh, like I'm making an argument, a causal argument, but when we started in 2009, there was not a single monograph that documented the um, work that Chicanas, Mexican American women, did in the social movement era. Not one. The, what, the first thing we did, and I think this resonates with Mariana's comments, is before even starting the project, we contacted every single person we knew who was working in this space. Uh, and, and this was based on the, my sort of bad fairy theory of scholarship and academia, which is if you don't invite all the fairies to the party, the bad fairy is gonna curse your child and on her 16th birthday, her quinceanera, she's going to uh, turn into a frog or fall asleep and the whole palace will fall asleep with her, right? So, so partially this was motivated by you know, really wanting to bring all the scholars that we knew, who we were networked with, um, into the fold. And I should also mention that, you know, I want to say that Linda Garcia Merchant, as I said, was, she worked in IT at an insurance company in Chicago and, and was a filmmaker. She was not an academic, and yet she was the co-director of this project from the very beginning. And that's another way in which it, it, it's not a typical sort of academic or scholarly project in that sense, right? And it's, it's, it's staffing of leadership. Right, so this was always a partnership. Now, the interesting thing about Linda is that she, I finally encouraged her to stop taking sick leave to come on trips with us, collecting trips, and for her to pursue a doctorate, which she did at the University of Nebraska and in DH in the English department. And is, she's now the data librarian uh, for the humanities cluster at the University of Houston. So when we talk about field building, it's these imperceptible ways, the ways that you were talking about building a cohort, Mary Emma, you know, we also have been building cohorts. We train undergraduate students. Many of those students have gone on to go get PhDs and also to go into library science. So even though I'm a, not a librarian or an archivist, we've been actively training students for that pipeline. They become very interested in archives. And as I was saying, you know, when we started in 2009, there wasn't a single monograph. A member of our advisory board that we convened in 2010 for the very first time uh, published a book in 2011 called Chicana Power, and that was the first monograph ever on Chicanas in the social movement era. We followed that up, members of the advisory board who have been active in Chicana Por Mirasa followed that up with a groundbreaking anthology of writing, uh, scholarly writing about Chicanas in the movement era, but also writing from the women that we interviewed and who have contributed to our collection. And what I want to emphasize here is we didn't ask them to write testimonio or autobiography. We asked them to write critical essays on the period. And they produced some of them, including my mother, Ana Nieto Gomez, many of the women who we've interviewed, co-inhabited, co co cohabitated. I don't know if that's, none of those are words. <laughs> but in our scholarly monograph, and this is the other thing I think is a strain that runs through all of our projects in, in that, you know, we're not necessarily respecting the kind of ivory tower divides or the rules of conduct. I mean, the important ones, yes. But, you know, that, that have con come to construct scholarship. You know, when we came up with Chicano Por it wasn't just about filling a gap. It was because we, women of color in the academy, were getting sick, they were dying, they were getting, um, they were all seeing therapists. The academy can be a very toxic place for us. And we really thought of the project as a way to stop competing with one another in a very small field, 
and to start building something together. This is the, the I think, yeah. a building a collaboration, a different way of making knowledge with community, with each other, where we supported each other, shared data, use new technologies, right, to support each other's work, and really lift each other up, instead of constantly being in competition for the jobs, the book prizes, the fellowships, right? And so I think there's something in this that when we talk about field building, it's also about sustaining ourselves in a place that was never designed for us and changing the narrative in that place by creating our own archives. And you know, yes, they're not institutionally uh, always acknowledged or supported, but this is, um, for us, it's life-saving work, not just professional development. So we're talking about field building. So we got to go back a little bit further because remember that this period of ethnic studies, black studies, women's studies was about changing fields, expanding, opening up the canon, the canon wars, all of this was part of that era. So what I saw happening, many of us, is that the ideological disputes often made it difficult to get certain kinds of work done. Mm. People wanted to build a program around this particular theoretical perspective or ideological point of view across the ethnic studies divide. Gender studies had meant much of that same kind of conflict. Programs fell apart. Departments were all literally at war with each other about that. So one of the things that happens when you start from this collections development side is that you cut through those kind of debates. You create the content that then lives beyond the, the, the ideological debates. But you also have a space where the pipeline enters and the field can grow and evolve continue to divide, new fields emerge, and so the knowledge that that field has then produced has defined itself. I, mean, I go back to the fact that the, you, know, you create content from the collections that you create, the description of those collections. So you have to have, fields are dividing all the time. You know, cultural anthropology, Fields are constantly evolving. So, but the content there is what matters. And so for, for, for me, you have to cut through some of the, the difficulties that a lot of us, I mean, I experienced those. Um, women were not involved in the early era of black studies. Mm -hmm. So we had to have another split so that you could involve more of that content. So, so this is part of the way higher education evolves knowledge gets expanded. So I think it's a natural process, it's just that we were guiding it somewhat differently at this moment. And it had to be done, otherwise, uh, we know that the academy is historically always behind times. It does not keep up with the times. And so those of us who are out there trying to push, you know, the truck up the road, <laughs> up the hill, have to be aware of splitting and bridging. Those two words I think are important, splitting and bridging, and I think fields do that all the time. So, questions? As, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open this up to the audience, but I'm gonna frame it a little bit. So I, uh, you know, when we think about collection building, uh, uh, as uh, these projects have done, but also uh, on the um, commission, K.J. Rawson, who was the creator of the Digital Transgender Archive, some of you may know. So, the, 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 certainly not everyone at Ayers in the Valley of the Shadow, I mean, these are projects that sometimes, uh, Valley of the Shadow grew up with the University of Virginia Libraries, but many times without involvement in the library. You know, we, we have a great audience of, uh, of not entirely, but many uh, librarians and people who work in libraries, archivists here. So. If you have thoughts or questions about the role of the library, what it could be, what it should be in supporting projects that grow up uh, with, uh, I mean, obviously all, many of you have projects where faculty members started with you or without you, right? 
Um, sometimes they come to you and they say, you know, I've got this hard drive and uh, I think the database is in Paradox 1994 and I forgot the password, but if you could get me the content I want to use in my class tomorrow. So, I mean, so that's the worst case scenario, but there's collection building of all kind going on with or without you. And one of the, one of the efforts of the commission will be to say, um, you know, to be directing recommendations to different constituencies. Here's, here's some recommendations directed towards department chairs. Here are some recommendations directed towards provosts. Here are some recommendations directed at AULs of technology and services. So, um, re so if you have qu questions or thoughts for our panelists about the role of institutional support in you know, rogue projects, projects that are built by the passion of an entrepreneur, somebody with a vision, uh, a team, a team that scraps for money and scraps and puts together their own data ethics policies. I mean, what, what would you like? What would you recommend? What do you see as gaps that we should be paying attention to as a, on this commission? I we're will gonna, say we got to let him sit with discomfort for a minute. She's a librarian. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Oh. Hi. Oh, I'm Karen Estland. I'm she, her from Colorado State University. And I just wanted to flip your question a little bit um, to the points that our panelists have made about the field and what it really is. And I think one of the topics we've talked about here is transdisciplinarity. These projects have been doing transdisciplinarity since I was born, and yet we're only funding the sciences. And so I think part of what we actually need to do is look at those terms and figure out where can we model our efforts and not say, oh, this is this great new thing that's happening in this area. Mm -hmm. Were you gonna say something? Well, it's really interesting to think sorry, about dis <laughs> disciplines the libraries versus departments, right? Like if we're, gonna, if we're talking about transdisciplinary work, and the, I mean, the humanities uh, evolved departments at a much slower, and disciplines at much slower pace than science. Sciences create new disciplines every day. Molecular biology comes and goes, astrophysics, right? I mean, these sciences create new fields based on, on the work that it's generating. And uh, humanities, you know, there's still an English department, there's still a history department. I mean, when Cornell changed the name of the, the English department from the English department to study of literature in English, it was a big effort, you know, two years ago. So, so uh, and that, to some people, that might not seem like the biggest change in the world. Um, so I think the question, I mean, I think you all in libraries, I mean, to, uh, turn it back to you. I mean, are, are libraries the barrier to transdisciplinary work? Are collection builders? Or is it departments? And that's probably uh, out of all of our pay grades to change that, right? <laughs> Meredith? So I think that we were always seeing ourselves as working against the borders of these disciplines. I don't know how we could not see that operating. The boundaries of the disciplines were often too resistant to the work we were doing. Think about when history refused to accept oral histories and oral history became a discipline in itself, a field in itself. 911, pushed that idea of oral history forward even further. Mm -hmm. So human events also occur, but I do think the boundaries that we are accustomed to operating in are automatically violated, if I can use that word, when you are dealing with content-specific experience, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with narratives of human beings and lived experience you break through those boundaries. And so you're always transforming the disciplines. You're always resisting what it is you're told is the right way to see something. So I think that's an ongoing process. Um, all the librarians I have worked with have, been, have reminded me that let's not let that disciplinary boundary hold you back. Mm -hmm. So even when we're defining genres, autobiography versus fiction. We have to be careful about that as well. So all of those systems have to shift. I mean, I think we're always, you know, boundary crossing, always, in the collections development work that we're doing. Although 
it makes sense to systematize it just for identification purposes. I think there's a other boundary that is important to note here. I mean, as a scholar, you know, as a, a tenure track uh, professor, you know, in the humanities, I think there's a strong bias in the humanities against the praxis, I would say, or the kind of work, the spade work of collection building. It's seen as the province, you know, it's very gendered, very much seen as the province of the librarian and the province of the theorist or the historian is to interpret. So like when you're someone who is trying to push at the boundaries, right, of, or, or trying to make an argument for a certain kind of praxis and one side of your work, this collection building or even professional development or field building is seen as pragmatic um, and, and less valued, frankly, uh, for all the metrics right, to, to get advancement um, as a tenure track professor, um, while another one is, in my opinion, overly valued, which is interpretation. You know, I mean, what do we say for dissertation writers? Like, it has to be an original contribution to the scholarship, right? And when you're someone who's working in these ways that are collaborative, collective, um, inside, outside of the community, uh, you know, sort of building and interpreting at the same time, a lot of times that gets really reduced to, oh, you're just building a collection? You know, we have librarians for that, right? I mean, the dismissiveness <laughs> of that ideology is really appalling, and I hate even articulating it in this space of um, intellectuals and scholars um, involved in the, you know, in communication and, and information. Um, but this is one of the things that I think, even beyond transdisciplinarity, is like how we do our work some part of our work is more valued than another part of our work. And for that reason, as many women <laughs> have experienced in their personal lives, we do a double shift, right? So we're building, we're teaching, we're creating these networks where, you know, we, we work with networks of scholars all, all across the, the US. You know, we have partner projects everywhere. All of that labor is not really part of the incentive structure um, of for, for uh, tenure tenure line faculty, right? Right. So um, sorry, I took it in a different direction. But. No, what you're saying is that all the institutes have underfunded the archivists. Yeah. I mean, that's what we do. No offense to librarians. Yeah. Archivists find the original content. We provide you with the original source. That's what we do. But if there's one of us in a department, that can't be done. Mm. Um, and I think now that we've shifted completely, almost to the digital world we all think we only need IT. You still need an archivist. <laughs> you still need an archivist to identify the source, to, credit, to um, provide um, credentials to that source and appraise it and know that it's the right thing to do and right thing to get and why, um, and allow us to help you provide access to it. Um, that's what we do. So all of our projects, if you heard, not only do we teach people to do the work, we give people tools to do the work. And do we rely on our home institutions or an academic institution for some of these, for some support? Of course we do, because we can't do it by ourselves. So I think the idea of collaborating is also to ensure that the academy is stronger than it's been before, because it's missing a lot of information that they'll need for future scholarship, that they need currently. And it's not all in bits and bytes, but it's also not us cleaning out attics and basements anymore either. Right. And I, I mean, it's worth mentioning that the rising demographic in our higher education space is students of color. That's just a reality. Texas is 40% uh, Latino right now. And in the high schools, it's more like 65. So, you know, this is a reality. We need this data. So we're ready for questions. Um, as uh, Clem moves, makes his way to the microphone and others too, let me, um, let me just uh, remind people of two things from the last CNI uh, in the fall that, that are, uh, are, are very much topics of conversation for the commission. So one was if anyone went to the funders panel last time, um, there was a lot of interest in funders at diversifying away from just supporting the usual suspects, right? From just supporting our ones. And, and yet, uh, and we found this in programs at ACLS too, that one can do outreach, but one, what one realizes is that the, 
the, the infrastructure around even grant applications, grant tracking, let alone the doing of work in, you know, in, in various fields uh, is underdeveloped, right? So it's not enough to just say we want to support a diversity of institutions. The question is what sort of collective services would support that? So that's one topic. There's change within and, and recommendations within institutions for, for future work. And there's also recommendations for collective action. But let's take questions, please. Yeah, so I have some questions about trust and time and how the libraries can be engaged in projects that I think really require a level of being in community, which we're hearing, um, building trust, um, doing work, like you said, that goes unfunded for the first 20 years while you're doing the trust building and the relationship building necessary to get these things off the ground. So when I hear about like, how can the library be involved? So much of that is interpersonal, interrelational, person-to-person -person work. It's not necessarily programmatic. And I think trust, trust might even decrease the more programmatic these projects become in some ways. Um, and so when I think about our community archiving work that we were doing at the University of Arizona and thinking about our post-custodial approaches, um, that's something that I think is hard to articulate hard to value when we come to some of the assessment and sort of incentives we have around how we, where we put our time and how we show impact and things like that. And so for me, that's a real question um, when we think about our libraries, our resourcing, and, and the, the importance of this work and the fact that it requires something that we're not necessarily incentivized to do, and it requires sort of long durational engagement that we're also, many of us kind of skip project to project and, or, or have a more of a transactional or consultational kind of mode of engagement. Um, so, so that's a question is sort of how do we um, balance some of those systemic or, or infrastructural issues of, of the way we're employed with, with what is actually required to do this work. Um, and I think that I, I just sit in that tension and I don't have answers except to, to surface it. <laughs> Partnerships are everything. Whatever collections you help build in communities co goes towards your collection development competency, period. That, mm. that they should not ever push back on that because that's what you're doing. I think it's really important to find a faculty ally and it's also important to build a student network. Students are the best. They can be a pain, but they're also the best because they will hit the ground running and you can get them to do a lot of things that you don't have time to do and they will help build those relationships. That's the start. Um, and then I, I, I have to say, it's always good to try to get funding, whether it's a small grant from the institution where you work or whether it's a community grant with a partnership with a public library or historical society. That's, that's hard to do, but it's possible. And the relationships that you work on each year points to all the competencies in your evaluation and the expectations that your managers and people have of you. It just not, not it, but it might not be in the exact area that they're thinking it should be, but you're still doing that, you're fulfilling the competency anyway. Let's take as many questions yeah. as we can. Clem? Uh, Clem Guthrie, University of Hawaii. Um, I was struck uh, by Maria's comment about collection building. So how do we change the narrative around collection building as a form of interpretation, because the, the work that you're doing, it's very much interpretation. You're making the selection of, of who are the participants, who are, who are those women, what were their writings. It's, 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 not, it's not like you're picking up a front end loader and just dumping a whole bunch of stuff in. There's a, there's a conscious interpretive piece to that, mm -hmm. uh, that narrative. Yes, thank you. I mean, I think it's true, and I would love to hear what Mariama thinks about this too, because the fact is that the recovery projects were a critically important part of the methodology and disciplinary practice of ethnic studies and women's studies at the very beginning. Why? Because there was, there was not a corpus. I mean, and so it was seen as a theoretical and interpretive act. Um, I, you know, one of the ways that I've approached this is by writing about method a lot. And so I have three or four articles where I'm like really sort of thinking about, thinking through practice, defining praxis as both a theoretical and a practical or pragmatic or applied 
uh, process, uh, but it's a sort of total process, right? So you have an idea about what should be collected and how it should be organized, but then really there's a theoretical apparatus, just as you were saying, that is first determining what knowledge needs to be part of the archive and also how it fits together. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think these are really deep-seated value, you know, deep-seated ideas and, the, and divisions in the value system and hierarchies of the university as a whole and doing this project has really opened my eyes to how deeply seated these values are and how problematic they are because they're also very gendered and classed in mm -hmm. terms of the hierarchies of the institution and what uh, is valued. So one of the things that um, we felt was a radical shift, um, Cambridge uh, University Press approached us, uh, when I say us, I mean the network that we had been working with at the History of Black Writing about doing uh, a 21st century uh, history of African American literature. Um, and so it was a no-brainer for me. That is, we had enough people who were working in special areas, who had, we had recovered enough work that we could expand the usual suspects when you do a history. Um, and that volume was an edit, it started out as two volumes, um, and then Cambridge decided their previous works in that land line didn't do very well, so this is a publishing issue. Uh, let's try to make a big one volume, and that's what we did. That volume is still pretty, pretty much out there, and we are getting ready to do another one, uh, just on each of the genres. That was so popular. So what that gave us an opportunity to do was to have that network, again, work on a publishing project, mm -hmm. meeting on a regular basis, we weren't using Zoom at the time or whatever the predecessor to Zoom was, that's what we did. Um, and some of the summer institutes that we did with NEH would, would forecast what we would talk about in some of that work. So we were taking stepping stones in trying to create knowledge, publish, expand the network, but doing the edited volume gave us the opportunity to, to debate our ideas. And one of the things that happened in that particular project is that we dismissed, proved this idea of black literature is primarily an oral literature or emerged from an oral tradition. We had people studying and talking about that in the introductory chapter lays out this idea of a written tradition as well as an oral tradition, and both of them have value in terms of thinking about the literature. So, the, the stepping stones for me were, again, the network, the knowledge network, the ability for people and early career scholars or authors of these chapters, so you meet the requirements that are needed. Um, and, I, and for me, it was the reason that the project could continue to grow, because it, it was adding value to other people's lives. It was utilizing the collection that we had, we had, we had built. Uh, and it continued to grow because people would bring us things. Uh, and right now, we have graduate students who are looking at African, the first generation of African women writers who are dying and who need to have this work collected, described, and in a, 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 a database. So that would be the way, for me, it becomes important to have your network involved in doing the work. Yeah. Please. Uh, hi. Um I'm Todd Grappone uh, from UCLA. Uh, part of my program is to run this thing called the Modern Endangered Archives Program. It's a regranting program. Sorry, can you speak a little slower and closer to oh, the microphone? Thanks. Sorry. No problem. It feels really loud to me. Um, uh, part of my program is to do this thing called the Modern Endangered Archives Program. It's a regranting program uh, for, uh, to digitize at risk content uh, across the global south. Uh, we have, uh, we put out annual calls, we've got a, uh, a panel of scholars we pull from all over the country. Um, uh, and I just wanted to say thank you to all of you, because I actually, you know, um, it's uh, very inspiring to, to hear the work you're doing. I uh, have a little piece of that myself. Meredith, I was a big fan of the document now, documenting now. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, this work is really rewarding at some of the uh, uh, most used digital content we collect 
um, because it's really collected to answer academic questions. So uh, that's all. Thanks. Thanks. Great. I think we have time for one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. Great. Thank you. Uh, Morris York. I'm from the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Um, so just going to follow a thought out here, so apologies if I have to roll back a couple times, but to your question of what the commission might consider for libraries and recommending in that space, um, I think what you all are just describing really resonates with me, particularly, say, we could look over 200 years of higher ed in the U.S., and we could maybe say higher ed actually grows and thrives because of the revolutions against it. <laughs> uh, Harvard in the early 1800s was teaching a very formalized European uh, form of knowledge, and it was the explicit rebellion against that that led to the flowering of American culture. Um, so I think this is really important is to what can we do in this space, and I think libraries are very natural allies and the ones that can work in this space. They are sort of funded to mission to support the formal curriculum and the formal scholarship. So to be able to bring light to this and to say, redirect resources towards the voices of dissent, towards the forgotten voices, towards the unremembered voices, because that's where life comes from, is where renewed culture um, comes from and allow libraries in academia to be allies in that space. Um, libraries have a real, uh, identity as memory institutions as well. So to speak to that, that, how libraries can be in support of human memory and not just academic memory, because it would be a shame if all we remembered was what the academy blessed, for instance. So mm -hmm. I don't know how to do that, but somehow <laughs> elevating that thread. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just want to um, touch on the the comment about collection building also being interpretation, that's partly why Duck now exists. Mm -hmm. we, what we noticed was once hashtag Ferguson became like the most tweeted hashtag ever for Twitter, um, we initially thought we could just buy the data set from Twitter. That's how we thought we could do it and then have people do research using the Twitter feed to um, explain the situation. And then Twitter kept changing their policies and kept changing their policies. By the time we got the grant, we realized we actually have to build tools. And partly why we were doing that too is because people were using tweet, tweet, uh, tweets and publishing them in news articles and in dissertations and in reports and not actually including the risk factors of that tweet. Do you actually know who's behind that tweet? Do you know if it's a robot, is a person, is the location accurate? What Are they really speaking to what you think they're speaking to? There were all these risk factors that people weren't considering as they were publishing with one or two tweets. And so that's when we realized, okay, we really have to build more than one tool, <laughs> not just for people to dissect the Twitter feed, but also to use it responsibly. And that's when we started talking about ethics, which also then led us to building a network of archivists helping activists or archivists helping community folks who were then being misinterpreted or um, almost assaulted for these the, the avenues of social media that they were using to communicate with one another. Um, so I think, yes, collection building can be interpretation and interpretation can be collection building. I think what we're advocating is that the, ac the, the academy support the work that we're doing in a way that's prosperous for all of us instead of us fighting them and the people we work with and everybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I think that day is starting to come. It's, it's been a long haul, but I think it's happening. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Cliff to come back up and, and send us on our way or close the, uh, the, the CNI session. Uh, thank you. to these, these are three of the 21 uh, commissioners. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor and thrill, really, to get to know them and their work and to stitch together very diverse um, uh, points of view. And some are uh, do-it-yourself people, some are collective action people. Uh, we're looking at all parts of the, the digital ecosystem. Uh, so, um, and to your question or your point about revolution and the role of the libraries in, in renovating and reviving uh, the academy, you know, the humanities are crying out for it. And it's not just because uh, of the demographics that Maria talked about, but it's, talk, it's where the energy and passion is and uh, in many of these fields. And so this is, this is work that, uh, that we can all engage on. And we, we, we look forward to uh, telling you more about the commission over the coming months. And uh, thank you for coming today. And Cliff.
Thank you all. <clears throat> that was really extraordinary and I think gave um, many of us here a very different perspective on the, the breadth and um, uh, nuance of the um, commission's thinking. Uh, it's, it's really um, just amazing to uh, hear all of this and I think you will find you have uh, many um, allies uh, among um, the uh, institutions and uh, individuals represented here. I greatly regret at this point that we didn't schedule this to run more like two and a half hours, except that I'm thinking uh, that would have been an awfully long ask for you. Uh, I know everybody's heard a lot today and has a lot to think about. I would say if you have further thoughts as you uh, mull over what you've heard today, if you send them along to uh, James, um, I'm sure he could uh, share them with the uh, uh, members of the commission and that those would be appreciated. Um, I will certainly keep our community posted as the work of the commission uh, proceeds and um, I think it's very likely um, you haven't heard the last of this. Please join me one more time in thanking this amazing closing panel. And with that, safe travels. I hope to see many of you at our December meeting in Washington, D.C. We will be doing a few things between now and then, and I hope I'll see some of you there or in other venues. Safe travels, and thank you so much for joining us.